Philadelphia is steep in broadcast history. From the early pioneering days of broadcasting in the 1920s to today, Philadelphia has always been at the forefront. The Delaware Valley has been home to some of the best local programming in the country, starting with the early soap operas and children's shows to pioneering the best news formats in the country, much of it all began right here. From radio announcers to television personalities, cameramen to directors, these were the broadcasters that burned up the airwaves. These were the pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. Welcome once again to this edition of Pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. And this time we really have a pioneer. We have a legend in Philadelphia Broadcasting. Uh, he's been on the air since 1960, actually started a few years before that, but continuously on the air since 1960. The geeter with the heater, the boss with the hot sauce, Jerry Blavitt. My man, yeah. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a couple of years, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. started... As I said, uh, you were actually on the air with your own yeah. show in 1960, but you began as a 13-year-old on bandstand. Tell us well, that story. How you that know, happened. it's so funny that you say that. We, we were talking about this. That's why I wrote the book. Uh, in the book that I wrote, You Only Rock Once, I talk about the fact that Bob Horn and Lee Stewart had bandstand back in 52. In 53, it was just Bob Horn's bandstand. And I snuck in because you had to be 14 years of age. And there was a dance contest going on. And I won the dance contest. Yeah. Tony Mamarella was the producer at that time. So I would go back again and there'd be another dance contest. I'd win that contest. After nobody the, ever asked for your driver's license or anything. No, nobody because checked. you see, we snuck in from South <laughs> Philly. So when you're entering a dance contest and you win, you got a little bit of a position. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Horn comes to me with Tony and he says, we just found out that you were not, how old are you? Uh -huh. I didn't lie. I said, I'm 13. Bob said, well, I'll tell you what, you're getting fan mail. Yeah. You're getting into the contest. You're winning the contest. This is what we got to do with you. You can't get into any more dance contest, but we're going to make you the head of the dance committee because as the head of the dance committee, you will be able to see the good dancers and rotate them on the floor. And one of your cameramen, Steve Sachs, remembers those days where mm -hmm. you would rotate the kids. So I became the head of the dance committee. I would leave Southeast Catholic at 2.15, go up to bandstand by three o'clock. The show would go on at 3.30. And one of my duties also was to select the records where we rate the records, okay? Mm -hmm. And also say, Bob would say, we have company. So I would have to take care of the guest stars. Uh, this is the, you're the, a 13-year-old taking <laughs> By this time now, from 1953 to 1956, I'm the head of the dance committee. I'm, I'm picking records. I'm staying with Bob Warren at his home in Levittown on weekends. And I'm meeting Connie, uh, Joni James, and I'm meeting the DeCastro sisters and J.P. Morgan and Perry Como and Sammy Davis Jr. And we became lifelong friends with Sammy. But through that period of time, Bob Horn was the guy. Bob Horn got arrested for drunken driving. And at that time, WFIL, Annenberg owned the Daily News and the Inquirer. And there was a whole big thing about DUI at that time. Was it simply DUI? I seem to recall there was more to it, alleged. Well, what happened here is that he was arrested for drunken driving. We had a dance at the Carmen Rotor Skating Rink, which was on Germantown Avenue. And they took Bob Horn off bandstand. He had just signed a three and a half year contract, a renewal for bandstand in 56. Bob was doing a radio show called Bandstand and a TV show called Bandstand. The deal was Jack Steck said, and he was program director at that time, we're gonna take you off, you're gonna do the radio show until the heat dies down. My duties were the same. Tony Mamarella, in the interim, became the host of Bandstand. I did what I had to do. Three weeks later, Bob Horn gets arrested again, this time drunk and driving, going up the street and hits a kid. It's the end of his career. He's not coming back. Next thing we know, he is suing WFIL. 
Next thing you know, there is a scandal about local disc jockeys involved with rings of women and girls. This guy's name appears, this guy's name appears, all of a sudden Bob Horn's name appears. That, of course, is what we remember of that time. You remember that? Time. Sure. What happened here is there was a clause in Bob Horn's contract, which I had the same thing when you did a teenage show, a morals clause. I had it as a reporter at WFIL. It, it was part of their standard That was their contract. big thing. That was the end of Bob Horn's lawsuit ah. against WFIL. Dick Clark comes in. Tony says, I'm going to introduce you to Dick Clark. Your duties are the same. The show will go network in August. You're getting $15 a week. We'll pay you double, $30 a week. Now, I was still seeing Bob Horn on weekends, staying at his house with his kids. And I said, no, we want Bob Horn back. Yeah. I seem to recall reading <laughs> at some point, maybe it was in your book, that, that you, you were uh, a friend of Bob Horn's. Bob Horn was the man that truly introduced me to show business. If I did not dance on bandstand, I would not be in that business today where I'm in. Because I met all these wonderful stars and I looked up to them. I mean, the way they dressed, the way they talked, strictly show business. And remember, I came from a broken home. Mm. My father was in and out of the can, God bless him. You know, he was in the rackets, number business, loan sharking, back that union things. So I was raised by nuns. My mother went to work as a riveter for me and to get money for me and my sister. We were raised by nuns. So bandstand was a whole different world for a kid like me. Mm -hmm. And he became adopted father. So when I found out, and Dick said to me, look, you will get $30, you're the most popular kid. I said, no. What do I do? I lead a protest. <laughs> 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 With all the kids on bandstand, we're picketing. We want Bob Horn back. Right. Next thing I know, now remember, I'm 16 this time. Okay. Next thing I know, the police come, I get arrested, the pickets go down, and that's the end of my career as a dancer. But I hang around with Nat Sigel, who was Bob's manager. And Nat Sigel booked Don Rickles, Patty Page at Chubby's, at the Celebrity Room. And he had a group. Names of the past. Like I mean, these, this is when Philly was exciting. Yeah. So he introduces me to a new comedian. He says, this is 1957, I'm 17. He says, look, I want you to take care of him. He's staying at the Sylvania Hotel, which is right around the corner from the celebrity room. Mm -hmm. The new comedian is Don Rickles. I become Rickles' valet. He's nervous as hell, but he's got to go through the audience and do his act. At the end of the act, we'd be in the dressing room, he said, go out for the side door, see if anybody's out there. Because at that time, his act, he was, he was insulting everybody. Oh, so he was concerned about that. <laughs> so, right, because you know, a lot of guys didn't take it at that time. So we became dear friends till this day. Now Nat has a group called Danny and the Juniors. They have a hit song called At the Hop. Well, who's gonna be the road manager? I'm a kid, I'm out in the street all the time. I say, mom, I'm gonna go on the road with Danny and the Juniors. I'm going to be the road manager. She didn't mind because I always was much older and I had a great love and respect for my mother. And my mother knew that I would always do the right thing. So I become the road manager of Danny and the Juniors. Mm. And this is a great story how Dick Clark and I bonded and cemented the friendship that we had to the very end. They do a show called The Little Theater, Beach Nut Gum, Ific. Dick Clark did Five Days Bandstand, and on Saturday at 7.30 on ABC, it was the Dick Clark Show from the Little Theater in New York City. He had Bobby Darren, he had Dion, he had Frankie Avalon, all the major stars at that time. He has Danny and the Juniors. So he knows I'm the road manager, and at that time, Dick was involved with the record business. There was nothing wrong at that time in 57 or 58 for disc jockeys to be involved with publishing or record companies or management companies. So he had the publishing of At The Hop. He sees me backstage, 
very cordial, Jerry, how you doing? Very fine, beep, beep, beep. And by the way, he still knows you led the protest against he him. He knew that I tried to knock him out of the box. Exactly, you sure. I stay in New York City. The next day, I'm going back to Philadelphia, getting on a train to Pennsylvania Station. Who's getting on the train? Dick Clark. He sees me, said, Jerry, are you going back to Philly? I said, yes, Dick. He says, sit with me. I figured, oh boy. So I sit on the train back and he starts to talk about Bob. He says, you know, I really wasn't a big fan of Bob's. You know, I, you know he looked at me as competition, la di ba 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 He said, when I took over Bandstand, he said, you might remember that you tried to stop me. <laughs> We offered you. You certainly remember that. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, where's this conversation going? I figure my days as a road manager <laughs> with Danny the Juniors, this is the king of the record industry. I'm done. He's going to yeah. say, turns around and says to me, I must tell you, I admire you for what you did. He said, your loyalty is amazing at your age. He said, I'll tell you, I know if I lose bandstand tomorrow and they have a new guy coming in, all of these record guys, all of these people in this industry who are so-called buddies of mine, if I lose bandstand, the next guy takes over everything. I will never have the loyalty mm. that you had shown to Bob Horn. We got off that train, Mike, and I swear to you, it's 1957, and I said, Dick, you've got my loyalty. Thank you. We became friends from the very moment. And how I got on radio is because of Dick Clark. That's the next story that we want to That's hear. That's the next story. You're playing the, poker? That, yeah, exactly. Yeah, tell that story. Shooting dice. Yeah. Yeah. Come off the road. This is 1959. Okay, and I get into a crap game with the guys from South Philly. One of the guys is Dom Pinto. He owns the Venus Lounge, very popular place. On Broad Street. Broad and, Broad and Reed. Okay. Now in those days, you didn't have rock and roll groups in lounges, you had them in clubs. Mm -hmm. This was a lounge. So we're shooting crap and he says, you know, we're doing great on the weekends, but I like to do something during the week. I like to maybe do a radio show like the old Steve Allison show mm -hmm. you might remember where it was WPN didn't Steve Allison get involved with the he got the involved thing. with the vice ring yeah. with Bob Horn another yeah. poor guy was Larry Brown yeah. that got involved you know they beat everybody beat the case because oh. it was something that was created by the Inquirer and Daily News oh. because of the Bob Horn contract oh. the morals clause. the morals clause so I get in the crap game. Yeah, I said the, poker, but it was it was crap. It was crap. It was yeah. crap. And the wise guys said to Don Pinto, well, you know, Blavitt, he's in show business. He knows everything there is, sarcastically. Yeah. So I said to these guys, yeah, I, I, can get a, I can do a radio show. Pinto said, what the hell do you know about radio? Now, I was visiting the disc jockeys as a promotion guy with Danny and the juniors. I see the way they operated in the studio. I said, I can get it. He said, you feel a whatever. I said, I'll tell you what, I got to make a six. If I make the six, mm -hmm. I'll do the radio show. You give me money and I'll get it done. You'll never make the six. Boom, boom, boom. Make the point. Guy says, holy shit. Okay, go do a radio show. I go up to WCAM in Camden. I buy the time. I go on the radio doing a talk show. Was Cal Rudman on at that time? That was not uh, when I went on. It yeah. was, it was Portia Perry. Yeah. What happened with CAM? It was owned by the city. Right. They had the Puerto Rican hour, Ricardo Munez. They had the Italian hour with Pacutia Bidenti. <laughs> they had the gospel show with Portia Perry. So you could buy the time. Gotcha. So I bought the time, and I was making pretty good because he gave me one hundred and twenty dollars. I took the $120, paid the station, but I was selling blocks for $60, a 15 minute block. So yeah. I had Chris Coney Oldsmobile, Dale Dance Studio, Frank's Soda back then, 
I, I was making six trip, 200 and some dollars for an hour. Uh, Snowstorm hits in 60. Right. Closes the Venus Lounge. Well, I got an obligation because I don't want to lose my 200 and some dollars. You're, doing the, you're doing the show from the Venus Lounge? Doing it from the Venus gotcha. Lounge. So, um, meanwhile, I'm also doing record hops in South Philadelphia at the Dixon House, you know, with the I'm kids. tired thinking about all the work you were doing around. Well, but, but you know, ahead. as I said, show business, you know, you stay young, Mike, as long as my passion carried me through everything in my life. And the audience, you know when you're hitting, when they come and see you, yeah. that feeling is like, wow. So to make a long story short, I say, I ain't gonna lose this money. To I call the kids up. We shovel out from my house in South Philly. I take my rock and roll records, Little Richard Fats Domino, because as a promotion guy and as a kid on bandstand, I would get all these records free for Rate the Record. Mm -hmm. I got all these records that I'm playing at the Record Hop. We go up to WCAM in Camden. We're on from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. I get there and they got the Big turntables. Now, I used to watch Jack Lamar, okay, and Sam Scott. And at that time, Pat Delcy was on WCAM also. Right. And they had these big turntables. But I would sit in the studio and watch the way they would do this and mm -hmm. that. So I knew how to spin. Right. I start to play Little Richard, Fat Stamino. The phones start to light up because the kids are surfing the dials to see if they're going to be closing with the school because of the snow. It was like the blizzard we had here, if uh -huh. you recall, okay? That's interesting. I don't get out of that station till three in the morning because they have no relief. I finally shovel with the kids in the car, back home, go to bed, 10 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. I'm sleeping. My wife said, Bud Hibbs is on the phone. He, at that time, was the general manager. C-A-M. C-A-M. They got to talk to you. Well, I'm I call him. He says it's important. I figured, mm, I may have a problem because I was only supposed to be on an hour. Yeah, Here I am, three and one. Thought you were in trouble. Right. He says, what did you do last night? I said, well, I said, look, I couldn't do the show from the Venus Lounge. I said, I stayed on the air. He said, no, what were you playing? I said, rock and roll. <laughs> He said, we've never had a reaction to this, ever. I decided at that moment, I wanted to play my music, okay? Dick Clark is a buddy. He, I would have dinner with Dick. He was like a mentor. I said, I'm playing rock and roll music. He said, well, I gotta tell you something. I'm getting calls from kids asking me what you're playing because I then started to play Twist and Shout, New Stuff, uh, Twist and Matilda, Quarter to Three. And Bandstand wasn't playing that kind of music at that well, point. I, bandstand was, but it, it, I was playing new things before Dick was playing it. But the reaction from the kids, because it would reach his ears, we became buddies. And I'm cooking and swinging. He now gets a franchise called Steer In. Steer In was a hamburger joint. Mm. And he also has the franchise for Dr. Pepper. So in 1960, he wants to do a broadcast with me on Admiral Wilson Boulevard, where he's opening up the Steer In. We do the broadcast. Well, Mike, you could not, they had police barricades because Admiral Wilson Boulevard was packed. That's how close and friends we were. He now is going to the West Coast. He's going to leave Philadelphia. This is in 60s. And take bandstand with him. Right. This is in the early 60s, okay? There's a party at the Venus Lounge, a going away party at the Venus Lounge. Dick says to Charlie O'Donnell, we're drinking. And we used to go to the Vesper Club. I don't know if you remember the Vesper Club. Oh, Vesper sure. Club was a private club. Yeah. And at that time, Dick was having problems with Barbara. They were separated, and he was living at the This park was his wife. Yes, the first wife. He was living at the Parktown. 
So we became really close late at night when you call, Gitter, let's have a drink, pop, 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 pop. So he says, which is so funny, he says to Luke Klein, he says, you know, you should think about developing a dance show with the Gitter because of the fact, you know, and at that time also, I was doing guest shots with Ed Hurst on Aquarama and Steel Pier. So, these are all names. Let me just, uh, in, if you're watching this in Iowa, perhaps you don't know these names. These are all people who are legends yeah. uh, here in the Philadelphia market. Yeah, I mean, so, Philly, was, Philly was so vibrant back then. Yeah. So, Lou Klein says to me, go out and make a pilot. Okay. Going to make a pilot for WFIL. I use the people from CAU. Bob Orlander, these guys are freelancing. Debbie Miller, Matt Robinson. Now, every one of these people became, in their own business, very big. Matt Robinson went on to write for The Cosby Show. Debbie Miller went on with William Morris to be a part of the television division. Bob Orlander used to be the ghostwriter when they used to do live broadcast out of WCAU, City Line Avenue. Mm -hmm. So I make the pilot. This is in 1965, okay? Send it over to Lou Klein. Don't hear nothing. The end of 65, I get a call from Al Hollander and Bruce Bryant, WCAU. My manager is Nat Sigel, who managed uh, Bob Horn, and a great lawyer, Harold Lipsius, is my attorney, who also had Jamie Guyden records, Philadelphia. Gentlemen, very interested in seeing the pilot. They heard about the pilot. Hmm. So they arrange a meeting. They look at the pilot. Bruce Bryant says to Al Hollander, who's the program director, I want, we want to do a show with this kid. I go up and I meet them. And they say, we don't like the pilot, but we like the way you moved with the kids and how, what would you do if you had your own TV show? I said, well, first of all, I don't want to be behind a podium. I don't want to wear a suit and tie. I want to be able to dance with the kids because I'm a dancer. Even to this day when I'm working, I'm dancing. Interesting. So you will not wear a suit and tie. Where would you stand? I said, I would have a round riser on top, me and the kids dancing around me. Yeah. What about the guest stars? I would have them on risers, but they would not lip sync. Wow. They would have to either do a track or we would have them do it live. Intriguing. Nobody's done that yet. I was about to say, nobody was nobody doing that. Nobody did that. Of... What would you call the show? I said, well, it's the music, it's a disc that I'm going to play. It's going to be the sound of rock and roll. It's going to be the discophonic scene, the world of the Yan team. And, and the rest is history. Boom. Uh, you know, let, me, let me just point out, we're recording this uh, in uh, 2016. Right. You go back on the air full time, or at least uh, right. consecutively, since 1960. That is, in fact, what makes you a legend here in Philadelphia. Well, I, it's, you know, uh, you know, it's just remarkable to have lasted that long. Mike, I said to you before, for young people to watch this, if I had to do this today, the way the industry is, it would not happen. Couldn't, couldn't do it today. The secret of show business is creativity. If you can think of something that's different, do it. My passion. When I went on the air, all the other jockeys said, what the hell is this guy doing? He's talking over a record. He's in and out. But they didn't realize that I knew music. If there are 16 beats to a bar, I would go, Jan Teen, don't be shamed, mention the Gita's name. Here's little Richard. Good golly, Miss Molly. So I knew musically. Back then, they had the clock. 
the black guys knew the music, but the white guys on Wibbage had a clock. And Wibbage, by the way, was the only other rock station That in was town. the only that was station. And then came WFIL. So when I began, I was a rebel. As a matter of fact, I said, I'm the rebel jock. The rock's the big tick-tock. So and really going back to, you couldn't do it today. You couldn't right. do it today. Uh, yeah. Uh, before I forget to ask this question, right. what's a geeter? That's in the book. Well, That's so tell funny. That story. I'm going to tell you what happened. When I started out, and the phones lit up, and I'm playing Little Richard, Fats Domino, Frankie Lyman, Bobby Day. I said, this is insane. At that time, disc jockeys were Joe Niagara, the rocking bird, Georgie Woods, the man with the goods, mm -hmm. Jocko, the ace from outer space. Everybody had a handle which you recognized who they were. So I said, this is crazy. I know nothing about this. I fell into it. Ah, an alligator that lives in the mud. They're like this. You go near it, it snatches you up. Ah, alligator, alligator. I can't be an alligator. Alligator, a gator, a gator, a, a gator <laughs> from an alligator. Now, how does it make sense? The kids hear me for the first time, and I got them. I'm like that alligator who <laughs> grabs you. But what rhymes with alligator, geeter, meter, geeter, geeter, meter, cedar? The heater. When I'm a kid on the corner, freezing, wintertime, your buddy comes by, you jump in the car, you say, turn that heater up. After five minutes, it's so hot. You say, turn that heater down. The parents are yelling at the kids with the dedications, turn that guy down, that rock and roll music. I was the geeter with the heater, the heater being the whole hot record pleater, the music with the scene with the record machine. That was it, the geeter, and it, it stuck. Oh, and everything it about it was magic. Because I drove a car, I called the car the Geeter's Black Phantom. And I wore chucka boots, open v-neck sweater, I danced with the kids and I called them Yan Teenagers. Now where'd that come? Shakespeare. Yonder lies my teens. Where? Yonder. Yon teens. Take a tip from the geet. Yon teens gather here. Let me tell you the sound I'm putting yond out there. So everything was like came from something else. You, you created your own language. Well, in that's what I did. And I made an album called For Lovers Only and I called the, the Amazons were the girls, the coyotes were the guys, you know. Uh, one question that, that I think we have to touch on, right. your alleged connection to the mob. Let me say, uh, I grew up in South Philadelphia. As I said, my father was a number writer. My father, back then, everybody knew everybody. Angelo Bruno was a neighbor. My mother and his wife, Sue, grew up. They were from the same town in Italy, Abruzzes. I knew Angelo all of my life, all of my life. And when I split with my wife, Patty, we had a big home, 22 room estate. And every Sunday I would take my kids out with Angelo's kids for dinner. When Sue Bruno found out that I had split and I was living at the Drake Hotel, she said, well, where are you having dinner at? I said, well, you know, Patty and I have some indifferent. So I have dinner with us. So I became then very close with them. I would have dinner with them, spend holidays with them. When Angelo got killed, Sue, Bruno, and, and Michael, the son, said, look, you're almost like a member of the family here. We're burying him, South Philadelphia burial. You know the press. You know... That's an image I have. Right. I remember you directing the right. media around. They said, please, don't make this like a circus. So I said to myself, you know, if I do this, I'm going to expose myself to a friendship that only people in the neighborhoods really knew. But I said to myself, this family was like my second family also after I split. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. And after that happened, I became under the eye of why is he so close to this situation? And that was it. I mean, you know, but again, you're from a neighborhood. I, I never asked the guy what his business was. If he extended a friendship to me, he was a friend. I, you know, that's the way I grew up. Yeah. 
I grew up with neighbors. Christmas time, my mother would make raviolis. Give this to Mrs. Panetti. My grandmother, she would make broccoli rob. Give this to Mrs. Amanati. I mean, you share things, you know. It's a different and, world. And you shared your music. Well, listen. And your time with us. And, and I really want to thank you. We could go for another half. We could keep talking forever. <laughs> okay, uh, But we, we've got to call an end to this thing. But I, I want to thank you so much for, for spending time with us and for what you've done for music here in Philadelphia. Well, uh, Mike, and perhaps it's only people of our age who appreciate the oldies. But uh, hopefully you've built a, a younger audience as well. Well, you know, in, in closing, Mike, as I said, for young people, if you find a passion, go for it. That's your legacy. That's it. Go for it, man. Thank you very much. It was terrific Thank talking you, with you. Thank you for being with us, and join us again next time on Pioneers of uh, Philadelphia Broadcasting. It was nice to spend time with you.